Okay, this lecture takes us a little bit deeper into the prophets, their method, their message, and we'll be looking specifically at the prophets Hosea and Jeremiah today. Hosea prophet before the Babylonian exile, and the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet during and after the exile. So we have some Selections from Hosea, from Jeremiah, and from Bartholomew, chapter 7. All right, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, you have instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, under the inspiration of the same Spirit, grant that we may be truly wise and never rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, before we get into Hosea and Jeremiah, we need to take stock of some historical background to the biblical prophets. So, we first need to account for what we have already summarized in previous lecture, namely the unification and division of Israel, just as a review. So King David, the one who unites the tribes into a kingdom and establishes Jerusalem as its capital. You see there a rendering of Jerusalem around its height during the reign of Solomon. Under David, Israel becomes a regional power, both economically and politically, and then Solomon builds the Jerusalem temple, leading Israel to its zenith or high point as a kingdom. However, Solomon's infidelity and abuse of the poor lead to deep social unrest, which in turn leads to division. Under Solomon's son Rehoboam, the ten northern tribes break off and form the kingdom of Israel with its capital in Samaria, and David's line continues to rule the kingdom of Judah in the south, with Jerusalem still as its capital. So that's the political background, you might say, to the era of the prophets. For 240 years, these two kingdoms continue side by side in relative stability, because in part, the powers surrounding them are in decline. So Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon are gathering their strength. But during this 240-year period, uh, Israel and Judah are more or less left alone. Now, Egypt continues to decline, but the two kingdoms to the east, Assyria, which is centered in Nineveh, in what is today northern Iraq, and Babylon, which is centered in what is today Baghdad, Iraq, they are ascendant. They're growing in power, influence, and military strength. And so during this time, God sends prophets to both Israel and Judah. So there are prophets in the northern and southern kingdoms. But eventually, Israel expands to the, or rather Assyria, expands to the borders of Israel and then forces Israel to pay tribute to it. So basically, Israel becomes a satellite of Assyria. And then in 722 BC, Assyria conquers, annexes, and absorbs Israel. And the 10 tribes are essentially lost to history. So Israel is, in a sense, eradicated. This was typical of the Assyrians back then. They would disperse and in a sense, annihilate the enemies that it conquered. Very militaristic kingdom, very ruthless and brutal. Uh, and Israel suffers the wrath of Assyria and the 10 tribes dissipate into history. Judah in the south, the two remaining tribes, they eventually become a vassal state to Assyria because Assyria has now advanced to its borders. But then Babylon, the other kingdom, in Mesopotamia, eventually defeats Assyria 
uh, invading and conquering and destroying the city of Nineveh in 612 BC. And the Bible and other historical accounts seem to corroborate uh, that Babylon completely levels Nineveh. So it tells you a little bit about Assyria that when it falls, it falls completely and there is no mercy shown upon Assyria. So Assyria has a rapid rise, but an even more rapid fall. And so Babylon has left the ruling power in the region. There's a king during this time named King Josiah who brings the people back to the law, to obeying the Torah, but his son eventually provokes uh, Babylon to war. His, his line provokes Babylon to war and they besiege Jerusalem and then eventually absorb it. Here are some maps to give you a sense of the scale of these kingdoms that are now going to overtake the chosen people in Israel and Judah. So the light blue there shows the initial expansion of the Assyrian Empire in the mid 800s BC. And then um, less than 200 years later, it expands all the way from what is today Armenia to Egypt, to lower or, or upper rather southern Egypt into Ethiopia. So um, from the Persian Gulf all the way to uh, Turkey. It was a huge kingdom that really expanded the entire Near East, comprised the entire Near East. Babylon takes over a similar area once uh, Assyria falls, which kind of makes sense. Uh, so you can see Babylon here is where Iraq, or Baghdad is today in Iraq. And the Babylonians take the same route, expanding northwest, and then taking a left turn down into the Levant, conquering um, what is today Syria, Lebanon, Israel, and then all the way down into Egypt. Babylon also expands down into the Arabian Peninsula as well. Here's a chart to give you a sense of the number of prophets and the general overview of, of the history we're talking about here. Uh, you'll see the line of the kings of Israel falls short of the line of the kings of Judah because it falls before Judah. And the prophets there during the time periods of these kings are, are listed on the left. And then the rulers of Assyria, Babylon, and then eventually Persia, which we haven't mentioned yet, are on the right there. So the era of the prophets um, begins with the kings of Israel and Judah, but the prophets also continue into the exile. People are taken into Babylon, and here's where the Jewish people really assume their identity independent of their land, and the prophets are instrumental in that. So um, there's a period of pre-exilic prophets, a period of post-exilic prophets, and Jeremiah is unique, somewhat unique, because um, he is right at the threshold of, of the exile there. So he's actually both a pre-exilic and a post-exilic prophet. Here's another chart that I thought I would leave for you that um, also specifies to whom these prophets prophesy to either Israel in the north, Judah in the south. It also gives you the relative dates. Now these prophets are listed in the order in which they appear in the Bible. So uh, you'll see very quickly there, if you compare the, the, the dates to the sequence here, they do not go in chronological order in the Bible. And we'll see the reason for, for that later. But in a nutshell, it's basically because the prophets are divided into major and minor prophets, major prophets being Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then the other 12 um, oftentimes were collected in a scroll called the Book of the Twelve, they are minor prophets, not so much because they weren't as important, but because their books, their legacy uh, is just shorter. So the writings of those 12 prophets can be included in one scroll. And so they were called minor just because their, their writings were shorter. Okay, or the writings about them. All right, so this is the key event now um, the central pivotal event in the history of ancient Israel, 
um, the fall of the Northern Kingdom and then the Babylonian exile, the Babylonian exile in particular, a central event that you need to know something about. So as I mentioned before, there's this king named Josiah and he rules Israel for over 30 years from the year 640 to 609 BC. And he's known for bringing Israel back to Torah observance. So during the period of Assyrian influence, the observance of the law wanes, but, and, and it seems as though they weren't even reading it anymore because there's a priest named Hilkiah who finds an old scroll in the temple. He doesn't know what it is. They discover what it is. And then King Josiah is kind of racked with uh, guilt and anxiety because he reads it and says, we haven't been doing this. So he institutes reforms to bring the people back into conformity with the law. And then once these reforms are in place, unfortunately, he makes a rash decision to go and lead the Israelites against the Egypts and the Egyptians, and he's killed in battle. And so his son Jehoiakim succeeds him as king. The rise of Babylon is occurring around this time. Babylon defeats Egypt at the Battle of Carchemish, which is actually in, in northern Syria. It's a giant chariot battle. One of the great chariot battles in history it takes place in 605 BC. So shortly after King Josiah dies. And this battle uh, puts Egypt to the sidelines. And so Babylon becomes the uh, power in the region. Judah then becomes a, a vassal of Babylon. So in the wake of uh, Babylon's ascendancy to have pretty much complete political control of the whole region, Judah pays tribute to Babylon so that Babylon won't come and invade Judah and destroy it. But the kings during this period, so this would be King Jehoiakim uh, and then his, uh, his son Jehoiakim, they resist this uh, subjugation. They, on the one hand, tried to make alliance with Egypt again to get some leverage against Babylon. They refused to pay the tribute. So they basically had to pay off the Babylon's almost like a tax to keep them at bay. They refused to pay, they allied with the Egyptians. And so Babylon takes measures to discipline them. So the first thing Babylon does is invade Jerusalem in 697 uh, or 597 BC. That should be 597 BC. And they overthrow the Israelite King Jeho Jehoiakim, who's the son of Jehoiakim, kind of confusing there. And they install a puppet king of their own named Zedekiah. And Zedekiah eventually also rebels against the Babylonians. And so they come back 10 years later. The Babylonians come back to Jerusalem in 587. There we go, that date is correct. And they conquer Jerusalem. First, they besiege it. And then once the people are out of food, they find a way to breach the walls, they get into the city and just level it. They destroy the city, they destroy the walls, they destroy the temple. So this is a famous painting of the destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BC. You see the temple burning, the city burning, and then the people fleeing and being led into exile. So King Zedekiah tries to escape, but is captured his sons are killed before his eyes, and then he, along with 4,600 others, these are mostly the elite uh, in, in Jerusalem, are taken to Babylon as captives. So this is the origin of the Babylonian exile. Babylon takes a portion, a remnant of the city's survivors. It's interesting that the poor are left behind to tend the farms and vineyards, so to keep some production going in the region. But those who could read, those who were high up in the hierarchy, they go to Babylon with the Babylonians and live in exile there. All right, so just to recap this a little bit, I thought I would show you a little portion of a video. Uh, it's a little bit old, it's from 1984. So it's, uh, you know, it shows its age, but uh, it's still a good summary of what all I've just been talking about. Uh, it's called Heritage, Civilization, and the Jews. This is from episode one called A People is Born. Major funding for the rebroadcast of this series has been provided by the Charles H. Revson Foundation, the estate of Mortimer J. Harrison. Sorry about that. There we go.
David's legacy was an empire. With the great powers, Egypt and Mesopotamia, both in temporary decline, Israel expanded to fill the vacuum. Israel's dominion extended north to the Euphrates, south to the borders of Sinai. The nation of refugees was now a ruler of subject peoples, Canaanites, Edomites, Moabites. David's son and heir, Solomon, consolidated Israel's new power and exploited it. In trade with the corners of the empire, luxury goods of all sorts were imported. They found a market among a new class of urban rich. Like the pharaohs of Egypt, Solomon launched an ambitious building program. Its keystone, the splendid temple in Jerusalem. The Bible account says he was seven years building the house of the Lord with its doors of olive wood, its planks of cedar covering every inch of wall so that no mere stone could be seen. Its carvings of palm trees and blossoms. Winged beasts called cherubim, their wings spreading from wall to wall, the figures overlaid with gold. But in the city of the Lord, Solomon permitted the worship of Baal and foreign cults. And there were other building projects. Solomon fortified Canaanite cities, Hatzor, Megiddo, Gezer. Gezer was the dowry of a foreign princess, one of Solomon's wives. Israel was now tied to a system of foreign alliances, bound to an imperial style that was undermining the old communal way of life. This is all that is left of Fortress Gezer. You can find it just off a busy highway, a half hour's drive from modern Jerusalem. An archeologist's dig, a tourist site. These stones behind me were the foundation of Solomon's massive gates. To build these fortifications, the whole network of citadels guarding the capital and the major trade routes, he resorted to a device of bitter memory, forced labor. To man these garrisons, he fell back on another drastic measure, military conscription. The imperial style could be supported only by a heavy burden of new taxes. This fell crushingly on the ordinary people, the small farmers and tradesmen. Around the year 920, after Solomon's death, rival claims to the throne erupted. The empire fell apart and the kingdom split in two. Israel in the north with a capital of its own, Judah in the south holding on to Jerusalem and the Holy Temple, two states going their separate ways. The Israelites had come a long way from their simple beginnings. The egalitarian life of the early settlements had been corrupted by power and affluence. In a society ruled by rank and privilege, who would speak for the ordinary people? You trample upon the poor and take from them exactions of wheat. You have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. These were the words of a shepherd named Amos. Amos, spelling out the symptoms of Israel's plight. Farmers and tradesmen forced into debt. A rising class of rich landowners collaborating with corrupt judges, exploiting their neighbor's distress. Listen to this, you who would devour the needy, annihilating the poor of the land, tilting a dishonest scale and selling grain refuse as grain. The Lord swears by the pride of Jacob, I will never forget any of their doings. In the eighth century, as inequities worsened and society disintegrated, the cry for social justice was taken up by other inspired dissidents, Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, the men we have come to know as the prophets. Some were imprisoned for their dissent. They preached against foreign alliances, against the spread of foreign cults. The prophets spoke as caretakers of the religion, recalling the Israelites to their origins, recalling them to God's law. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. 
but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Justice and righteousness. The absence of justice was nothing less than a violation of the covenant that was Israel's foundation, the heritage of Sinai. A terrible retribution was promised. You princes of the house of Israel, who hate the good and love the evil, because of you shall Zion be plowed as a field and Jerusalem become rubble. In fact, the danger was not far off. Egypt and Mesopotamia were stirring again, the empire of the pharaohs being challenged by a dynamic military force from Assyria. In the course of this conflict, the northern kingdom of Israel was reduced to a vassal state, surviving only by paying tribute to the Assyrians. Then it was simply swept up into the empire. A century later, the armies of Babylon came marching west and in 605, defeated the Egyptians. Judah was occupied by the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar. Jerusalem was pillaged. At least 10,000 families were sent into exile. The temple was destroyed by fire. How the city does sit solitary that was full of people. She that was great among the nations. How she has become a vassal. Judah is gone into exile. She dwells among the heathen. She finds no rest. The year was 586 before the common era, one of the bitterest years in Jewish memory. The life of the independent nation was ended. Its unifying symbol, the temple, was in ruins. The leadership in exile in Babylon. In this majestic city of perhaps a million people, more than 500 miles from ruined Jerusalem, a group of Hebrew scribes set about organizing and assimilating their people's history. This is where they assembled the Lord, written and spoken, the writings and sayings of their leaders, poets and prophets, assembled it into the first books of the Bible, into their great national work, the Torah. Okay, so that gives you some more of the background there. The one discrepancy worth mentioning is he did say 586 is the year that um, Jerusalem fell and the uh, Israelites were taken into exile. Uh, now more scholars will say it was 587, but really you know, that, that's, that's pretty exact for <laughs> such a, an ancient event. So 587, 586. Um, is when the uh, Jerusalem fell. All right, let's talk a little bit about the role of the prophet, the message of the prophet, before we get to Hosea and Jeremiah. So what is a prophet? It's not a fortune teller, not just somebody who tells the future, but rather one who explains the meaning of present events and practices in light of what God has done for the people. So recalling the past, looking at the present in light of God's history with the people, but also then communicating God's will and intentions for them into the future. So it has uh, much more to do with how they see the present in light of the past and what that means for where God is leading them. So it isn't just sort of predicting the future. The prophets, Nevi'im in Hebrew, play a specific and vital role in Israel's history. <clears throat> they bear the word of the Lord. Now this phrase is very important in the prophetic books. We'll see it over and over again. Thus says the Lord, the word of the Lord came. Uh, the prophet spoke the word of the Lord to the people. And this word is spoken especially to those in power and authority. The prophets deliver their message through speech. So they do speak in public. Uh, on occasion, they commit their words to writing, but that's rare. They also, though, communicate their message through action. Sometimes their message is performed in symbolic ways. And even their speech is filled with analogies, metaphors, imagery taken from the natural world uh, in order to get the message across. And Jesus's own speech 
bear some similarities here. He uh, teaches by comparison through parable. The prophets do much the same thing. They're not content just to give an abstract message, but they couch it, they frame it in terms of imagery and symbolism and analogies. And sometimes they act it out. Some of the prophets are closely allied with the kings, like Nathan was with David, while others, and I would say most, <coughs> are pariahs to the ruling authorities. They are set against the kings, are often the object of persecution by the kings. So just a quick word about the books of the prophets in the Bible. The way the Bible organizes the prophetic books um, is, is like this. So there are early prophets in, in Samuel in the book of Kings, which you read about, Nathan, Elijah, and Elisha. And then come the four major prophets. And they are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And they're grouped this way because their books are the longest, are the biggest. And then follow the 12 minor prophets, again, not in chronological order, or even in order of importance. And these include Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So the prophets point out primarily Israel's hypocrisy, their infidelity, and their complacency, their injustice, and the futility of their actions. And they're calling Israel to a deeper faithfulness to their covenant with God and to a greater uh, form of life. Uh, where God can fulfill the promises that he's made to the people. Here's the uh, board work handout again, um, nicely organized. You see how they group the books of the prophets. So Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Uh, these are sometimes called the former prophets. They are kind of like quasi-prophets. You see these uh, precursors to the classic prophets, people like Nathan, Elijah and Elisha, who in a sense sort of set the pattern for the latter prophets, who are characterized by social interventions, messages to the people, um, pleading with them to return to the Lord, to abandon their corruption and infidelity. And they also come to prophesy about a king who will come and fulfill the Lord's promise to David. And this would be the Messiah, who will lead Israel back to a full and complete uh, restoration. Okay, so what is the prophet's message? What is the prophet trying to convey? Well, first of all, their message is about faithfulness. They're pleading to the people to be faithful to the Lord, to give the Lord exclusive devotion. They sometimes do speak about proper ways of worship or prayer, and especially warning against merely external perfunctory performances of worship and piety. They have a focus on the interior, the intention, the motive for religious worship and prayer. And they also focus heavily upon idolatry, uh, combating it, forbidding it, even sometimes making fun of it. They're trying to get the people to turn away from devotion to other gods. They also speak, as the video said, against foreign alliances, but that has to do more with their faithfulness to the law, their covenant, how they act with one another. This has to do with political policy. So they very much um, speak against allying Israel to other powers upon which they would then depend. They speak to issues of social justice. They're very concerned about the plight of the poor. The most strident messages um, are reserved for abuses of the poor, I would say. And they also, exhort the people to greater integrity in their own personal conduct. And you see here a rise in, uh, in the sense of, of personal responsibility for actions and not just external conformity to the precepts of the law. So there's an increasing interiority in the focus of the prophets. They're interested not just in what the people do, but also why they do it. The other aspect of the prophet's message, the historical consequences that may come about Sometimes, depending on how they respond to the prophet's message, sometimes whether or not they respond to it in one way or another. Sometimes they just say, this is coming down the pike. These historical consequences are uh, spelled out for breaches of faith. And those would namely be death, affliction, foreign invasion, exile, fragmentation, 
So this is sort of the doom and gloom prophecy that they delivered to the people. Because you have forsaken the Lord, forgotten the Lord, and turned after these other gods and allied yourself with these foreign nations, you will experience all of these things. <clears throat> and what you thought was secure and eternal will be taken from you. <clears throat> they also spell out historical consequences for their repentance, for coming back to the Lord, for returning to faithful relationships to the Lord. And sometimes this is in the far future. Sometimes it's still a present possibility, but it's always associated with life, with healing, with restoration, renewal, and consolation. And they have both of these. So they have the negative and the positive. They have the critical and also the constructive. Uh, the prophecies that would lead to despair and anxiety and the prophecies that would lead to hope. Um, so it's really about creative destruction. These two elements, sometimes like in the book of Hosea and Jeremiah, they appear side by side. And it's almost like a schizophrenic back and forth of God is coming for you. You're going to experience these woes and afflictions because of your unfaithfulness. And then the very next chapter, the Lord plans to restore you because of his faithful love and will bring you back and settle you in the land. So they're present side by side, the aspect of destruction and the aspect of creation and renewal. It's captured in the first chapter of Jeremiah very nicely. And the Lord presents himself to uh, Jeremiah and says he's sending him as a prophet. He says, see, I place my words in your mouth to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and demolish, to build up and to plant. So you see there, emphasize more prominently the destruction part uproot, tear down, destroy, demolish, but also to build and to plant. What comes out of the punishment and destruction is always something life-giving and renewing. God's always going to build something new out of the ashes. So the prophet's message begins with foreboding and threat, but it always leads to and contrasts with the Lord's faithfulness to the people's unfaithfulness and to this eventual renewal. The prophets, you might say, are kind of prosecutors to the people. They'd lay out the case against the people to stir them up from their hypocrisy, to get them to change their actions, to change their ways. And then they do ultimately hold out this vision of a future that is hopeful and that is different, but better than the present patterns in which they've fallen in. Okay, so now finally to the prophet Hosea. So what do we need to know about the prophet Hosea? Well, first of all, his context, he's a prophet in Israel, so the northern kingdom, right before the Assyrians come and uh, take over. So this is around 750 to 725, and you may recall Assyria conquers and annexes Israel in 722. 722 is when the northern kingdom falls to Assyria. And he addresses his prophecy to Israel, and sometimes refers to them as Jacob, and then sometimes as Ephraim. And the only thing I'll mention about the Ephraim part is that Ephraim was the tribe that had the land in the northernmost part of the kingdom of Israel. So Ephraim takes on special importance because they're the ones that are first going to meet the invading army. So they're kind of like the tip of the spear. They're right on the front where Assyria will eventually invade. Hosea is also the first prophet to compare God's covenant relationship with Israel to a marriage. So this analogy to marriage really appears prominently for the first time in the prophet Hosea, and it's central to his message. So Hosea begins with the Lord coming to Hosea and speaking to him and telling him to go and marry a prostitute. And this woman's name is Gomer. So he goes and does it. And eventually he has children with Gomer, and he names these children in uh, uh, strange ways. He names them for they, af after basically messages uh, that the Lord is giving to Israel. So the first child that they have, they give the name uh, Jezreel. For in a little while, I will punish the house of Yehu. And then the next child, they name not pitied, for I will no longer feel pity for the house of Israel. And then the next child is named, not my people, for you are not my people and I am not, I am for you. So these poor kids, but uh, Hosea was using the children that he had with Gomer to deliver messages to uh, the people of Israel. So why does he do this? Why does the Lord tell Hosea to go and marry a woman who uh, is unfaithful? And so she doesn't stop her profession. 
when uh, Hosea marries her. So that's the other thing. She continues to sleep around uh, after they're married. So for good reason, Hosea doesn't even know if these children are his. The reason why he does this is to embody a message, <clears throat> a message of both accusation and hope through this relationship. It is, in a sense, an embodied symbol. The way that Hosea uh, lives his life is, in a sense, a symbol for what the Lord is trying to communicate to the people. And the thing about Hosea's relationship to this prostitute is that he actually loves her. So the Lord commands Hosea, go love a woman who is loved by her spouse but commits adultery. So this is after he's married to her and becomes attached to her. She goes off and uh, attaches herself to other men. And who knows what, what it involves. Uh, but uh, she goes off not just with one but multiple other men. And it seems as though um, she becomes quite established with some of them because when she finally says, it was better to be with my husband than to be where I am now, Hosea arranges to take her back for a small price. So he basically buys her back from this uh, paramour with which she was committing adultery. And this is also a message so just as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods, Hosea loves Gomer, even though she has turned to other men, and he takes her back. So that's sort of the central aspect of the, the performance here, the life performance. Israel has prostituted itself to other gods. And I think I mentioned this before. It's an apt analogy because prostitution as compared to marriage is transactional, and it's really about mutual exploitation, right? The prostitute needs money. The person who's who's you know, buying the uh, commodity here is it's really buying a commodity, uh, uh, you know, pleasure. So they treat the prostitute as, in a sense, an object to get something that they want, namely pleasure. There's no personal attachment here. There's no personal commitment. Uh, and that's the way Israel is with its other gods. It's a transactional relationship, and it's a relationship that's basically meant to make them feel better and not to invest themselves in uh, what they're worshiping. So the message here is the Lord will punish Israel in the way that, you know, a husband would punish and admonish a wife who goes off in this way uh, by withdrawing support and protection. But then the Lord says to Hosea, I will allure her now. And he's talking about Israel. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak persuasively to her. So he not only takes her back, but he takes her back with an aim to reestablishing this bond. It's kind of hard to understand. But nevertheless, it, it brings the point home to the people. I'm not only going to, the Lord will not only take you back, but he will take you back lovingly and lead you back and try to establish the love relationship that you once had with the trust, with the intimacy that has been shattered by the adultery. So the point of Hosea is really that the Lord will continue to love and pursue Israel despite her infidelity. And this is also something that's kind of unheard of back in that time that, uh, you know, a cuckolded husband, a spurned husband, would go in pursuit of the woman that has left him. Um, it was almost sort of a, a humbling experience, a violation of dignity. And even if he did do that, it would basically be like going back to get what's his, a matter of pride, and not about trying to woo the woman back, win her back to, to him. Okay, so that's Hosea. So now on to the prophet Jeremiah, who prophesies uh, about 150 years later from 598 to uh, 587 BC and afterward too. So 587, 586 is the time of the exile, but Judah falls. And as we'll see, Jeremiah goes to Egypt, but he continues to prophesy even after the exile. He is the only prophet to do so. So he's basically forced to flee into Egypt with a group of Israelites who escape, and they go down into Egypt instead of the ex instead of into exile with Babylon. So he's also the first prophet to explicitly commit his words and actions to writing. He instructs a scribe named Baruch to write it down, and uh, this is very rare. So usually the prophets basically just spoke, they did their thing, and later their followers would record their sayings and then add to them over time. 
apparently Jeremiah himself instructed that his words be written down so they'd be remembered, his actions would be written down, and that the history that surrounds Jeremiah would be written down. So that's another point to say about Jeremiah. It's a mixture of both prophecy, so a message that's delivered to the people by the prophet, and also history, so this historical narrative framing that uh, message. All right, so the book opens up with Jeremiah's call, which is the first thing to really note. And it says that before Jeremiah was born, the Lord knew him, dedicated him from the womb, and appointed him before birth. It's sort of a portrayal of intimate knowledge and also um, vocation. That he was called even before he was born to this mission. And he's given this mission, he's given these words to speak to the people, but like Moses, he resists. He says, I'm not a good speaker. Just like Moses, he says that. And the Lord says, well, I will put the words into your mouth. But before he actually says that, he gives uh, I, uh, Jeremiah this vision. He gives Jeremiah a vision of like a boiling cauldron. And then he says, my anger at Israel will boil over and that this uh, torrent will come from the north and will overwhelm uh, Israel and, and, and Judah. And uh, Judah will eventually be taken into to exile. So uh, he's given the message, he's given visions to go along with the message, and so he embarks on his work. So what is Jeremiah's message? Well, first he delivers a scathing message to the people, particularly about their religious practices. So in Jeremiah 7, which is oftentimes called the temple sermon, he actually goes into the temple and really lays it into the people about their practices of child sacrifice, of uh, bribery, of financial exploitation of the poor. And he actually um, mocks them by saying, you do all these things, and yet you say, the temple, the temple, the temple, as if that's going to protect you from God's wrath. And he says, has this house which bears my name become in your eyes a den of thieves? So it's true, Christ says that when he enters the temple, but he's really just quoting Jeremiah when Jesus says this, that my house has become a den of robbers. You do all these things and you think the mere presence of the temple is going to protect you. What the Lord wants really is you from to turn from these corrupt and unfaithful practices and to do what's right. Um, and so then he foretells that the anger and wrath will pour upon this place and that um, their actions will not go uh, unpunished. Okay, he also suffers hardship, opposition, and persecution throughout his uh, time as prophet. So the, the picture on the bottom left there shows Jeremiah being um, lowered into a dungeon where he was kept for a while in a um, priest's house. Uh, he's beaten. His life is threatened over and over again because he's opposing the practices and alliances of the people at the time. And he really comes to a place of despair. In chapter 20, he says, um, I wish that I could just repress all of this. I wish I had never heard of the Lord. It's kind of like Job here. I wish I had never uh, known what the Lord wanted. I wish I was never even born. So it's a, a expression of despair, very similar to Job's. But he has this to say in response. I mean, he accuses the Lord, just like Job. You seduced me. You tricked me. And I let myself be seduced. You were too strong for me and you prevailed. All day long, I'm the object of laughter. Everyone mocks me. I wish I were never born. But then when I say I'm no longer going to speak, it is as if a fire is burning in my heart, imprisoned in my bones. I grow weary holding it back. I cannot hold it back. So he can't refrain from speaking. He says it's like a fire in his bones. And he's compelled. He's compelled to speak the word of the Lord to the people, even though he knows um, it will bring all of the suffering for him. He's also one of the prophets that explicitly never marries which is rare for uh, Jews of the time. So he foregoes marriage and family on account of his prophetic ministry. 
And he also performs his message. So at one point he's sculpting a pot. Another point he's wearing a yoke like an ox. And he uses these to convey a message in a pictorial way. He's saying the Lord is shaping you like clay, just like this pot. And just as a potter isn't afraid to start over if his project doesn't go well, so God will not be afraid to start over with you. So don't presume that just because the Lord chose you, that's the end of the story. You have to be supple in his hands. You have to allow him to shape you like the potter shapes the clay. With the yoke analogy, he's basically saying you have thrown off the yoke of the Lord, so you've refused to submit. You said, I won't serve. But then he says, you'll be given another yoke in place of that yoke, and it will be the yoke the Babylonians will put on you. But it's interesting. He says, don't resist it. The way forward for you is to submit to this yoke and to go and to live in Babylon and to live there and try to benefit the uh, people there as much as possible. And then one day you will come back. So it's a very specific prophecy about uh, their exile into Babylon and a very specific instruction. Don't resist too much. Stay there. Try to retain some stability. Submit to their yoke. Go along with your exile until you have a chance to return, which they eventually do about 50 years later. So his message basically culminates with the um, famous 31st chapter in which he lays out this new vision for the people, which will involve a new covenant. He says that the Lord will bring back Israel and will establish a new covenant with her the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will place my law within them and write it upon their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So the law will no longer be external, but internal. You see this interior focus of the prophets. And of course, Christians see in this uh, foreshadowing of the new and everlasting prophet uh, uh, covenant, the new and everlasting covenant in which the law of the Lord through the Holy Spirit will be placed inside each person. And it won't just be a matter of interacting with some external law, but the law itself will rest in the hearts of the faithful. Okay, finally, what do the prophets reveal about God? And here we get into a little bit of the seventh chapter in Bartholomew. So the prophets usually begin with accusation. Israel has forgotten the Lord, but the Lord will never forget Israel. So Pharaoh forgot about Joseph, and then uh, you know Solomon forgets about uh, the Torah. The people eventually forget about the Exodus, what the Lord has done for them. It's all about forgetting, and the prophets are there to remind the people that the Lord doesn't forget them, and the prophets remind the people of what the Lord has done for them and what the Lord expects from them. And there's this moving passage from Isaiah that really captures this nicely. It uh, goes, a mother may forget her child, have no regard for the child of her womb, but even so, the Lord will not forget you. And then the very next verse says, see, I have engraved you upon the palms of my hands. It's a beautiful image that even if a mother may forget, that the Lord will not forget, and that the Lord has a mark upon the palm of his hands to remind him of his people. So the message basically boils down to that God is not only a creator, ruler, and a covenant partner, but God is also a lover. Here's the centrality of Hosea's marriage analogy, and also the pathos that's exhibited by Jeremiah. That God isn't just interested in correcting and, um, you know, exacting vengeance. He's about expressing this deep love for an intimate connection with the people. So it's not enough for us to love what we imagine God to be. This is what religion oftentimes descends into. You're relating to an object produced by your imagination, which may or may not resemble the true God, we must love God as he is, the reality of God, not the idea of God, the reality of God, and not even sort of the stipulated uh, cause-effect relationship that's given by the covenant, 
we have to love the Lord for himself, for who he is. This is an intimate relationship of, of lovers going on here. This is kind of where the prophets take the whole relationship between humanity and God. God is jealous. So God reveals himself to Moses this way. He even says, my name is Jealous, like with a capital J. What do we make of that? Usually jealousy is a negative attribute. But God is a jealous lover in the sense that he's not content with the relationship that the people have established with him because they've made him into a prop. They've made him into a, a, a token, something to make themselves feel better. And he's not content to become a prop. And he won't just sit on the sidelines and be ignored. He intervenes. The Lord takes action to um, basically conduct an intervention with the people and to bring them back to a reality, uh, a relationship with him, with the reality of who he is. So he won't let go. And he goes in pursuit of those who have forgotten and strayed away from him. And the analogy here that I like is fire. I mean, Jeremiah says he has fire in his bones, but you could also compare God's love to a fire. So God's love is the reason we exist, sort of the motive for creation. God creates out of love. God chooses Israel, not because Israel has done anything great or, you know, is on the top of any ranking in humanity. It's because the Lord loved Israel that he chose her. And so this love can't simply go away. This love can't simply become irrelevant to who we are, to who Israel is. So the love is, is there as an explanation for why we exist, for the love that's the source of God's uh, choosing Israel, God's election of Israel. And something will come of it because it can't just simply go away. And so this love always present will affect us, and especially will affect Israel, but its effect will depend on how that love is received. And just like fire, this love can burn and consume and destroy the people if it's rejected or resisted, or it can give light, warmth, and life. And so it can have these two different effects, one that's negative and destructive, one that's positive and constructive. One that's associated with, you might say, jealousy or anger. God isn't just content to sort of say, oh, fine, okay, I'll go somewhere else. He can't because he's there at every moment. He's the reason why we're, we're, we're here. But the love, when we turn back to the Lord, becomes mercy. It becomes tenderness. It becomes fidelity. And so this, how, this can explain why the Love of God and the jealousy of God are really two sides of the same coin, two sides of the same pleading, passionate love, which the Lord shows to the people of Israel. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys in class.